very much for being back tonight and taking advantage of another opportunity to what you've got. Also, those of you who came uh, at 4 o'clock, a little bit after that, to be able to help participate in another vacation Bible school organization meeting. We've got a lesson there for that. Appreciate that so very much. There'll be another meeting in about two weeks. Then we'll be able to have some time in May our first uh, work day. Now, for those who have not been here for that, to me, that's a pretty impressive event. You see so many, two or three dozen of the members come and be ready to spend uh, hours and hours on a Saturday morning, early afternoon. I know uh, time's passed, but the last month or six weeks, we've got that started. And this year, we're going to do a little bit ahead of time and try to maybe have one big uh, weekend or one big work party for a uh, month until we get everything ready. So let me commend uh, those of you who have been working hard already those work parties. We hope to, to have a good turnout for the congregation. Tonight we want to finish the lesson that we began today. Basically the question is, can a Christian fall from grace? And by the way, there are about 40 copies of a two-page handout on the table of prayer. There were the bulletins are kept. If you want to get your copy of that, and this is, a, as we mentioned this morning, a subject in which there's a lot of disagreement. A lot of people in this area have adopted a view that uh, Oh, if you can, once you've got it, you can't lose it. You begin to act in this way, you never had it to begin with. That's not what the scriptures teach. Grace is so very important, and to show you at least one of numerous passages. In fact, the word grace comes from the Greek word grace, and it's found about 171 times in the New Testament. I think God's trying to get our attention to that. If we listen well, then we will understand the gravity of it. But turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 20. This is a portion of the conversation that the Apostle Paul had with Ephesian elders at Miletus. This would be the last time in earthly flesh that he would see them. The verse 28, a very memorable passage when he warns them, he challenged to them, take, or therefore take each to yourself. Acts 20, verse 28. And to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this. After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speak of perverse things, and draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years they did not cease to warn everyone, night and day with tears. We can imagine the Apostle Paul is concerned. He'd uh, been there for years, trying to help and to strengthen that congregation. He knew the wolves were worse. <coughs> Notice again verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That same word of grace is available to us today. 1,956 verses of the New Testament. It can build us up. This is us today as it did back then and it can prepare us for the great inheritance is there waiting for us when the Lord finally calls uh, the church home. Now, as we consider the future of Woodhill, as we mentioned this morning, we want to develop attitudes and actions that will continue to grow. Our appreciation of grace, and making this a, a place of grace, is something that's important. And so, going through these Bible passages uh, this morning and tonight will hopefully help us understand that something so valuable can be lost and as we go through this. We want you to know the context of how these things are lost. And so let's begin tonight with the book of John chapter 15. The book of John chapter 15. The passage that was read so long a few minutes ago. As we see Jesus divine, he refers to the church, and those churches make it up as the branches. Look what he has to say. And the, the theme of the, of the passage. I am the true vine, my Father, is the vine dresser every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. And I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides with me and I in him bears much fruit for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. I think it should be obvious to all what Jesus talked about. Jesus respects 
the branches to grow, to bear fruit individually and collectively as congregation. If it doesn't happen, the Lord has no use for us in the church. And so we see the, the hardship, we see the, the consequence of those people in our predication. We might find trees, you know, in our yard, or the nucleus from the root system don't make it up to the branches. What do we do? We prune them. It's needed. The tree comes back better off. That way they can be a all the, the nutrients can be placed there and the part of the tree that's, that's doing well. The Lord makes spiritual nutrients available to all of us so we might be conformed to His image. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good. We have to love the Lord. The next verse talks about what the goal is. Everyone be conformed to the image of the Son. What was that like? Jesus was the Lord. He certainly bore fruit in His life and it's the expectation it's the demand that Christians bear for his way. What does that mean? It means we grow. The grace and knowledge of God for your son, as we mentioned this morning, it means we you know what would be one fruit of the church. How about other Christians? To be able to let, as we sang a little while ago, the children's uh, kids sing time, let our light shine so that people might be able to look at us and say, hey, these people are different. You may not be uh, very well qualified or trained or have uh, the teaching skill that you would like to have, but there are people here uh, who certainly know how to close the deal, who know, can open the scriptures, but you can do your part and get somebody excited about the possibilities of the Christian life because they see yours. Because your life, the way you live, your attitudes and actions are such a great nature and a holy nature. People say, I want what you've got. I want your peace. I want the joy that you have. And that fruit can be seen. Look, if you will, first Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. The Apostle Paul was perhaps one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. He didn't have to worry about such things. He didn't have to worry about being careful with his soul. Let's see what the answer is. In First Corinthians chapter 9, we begin to read it with me at verse 24. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a, a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become this false well, this false well, anchor. Paul says, you know, when I'm making this preaching known to you, I've got to, I've got to apply it myself. Discipline my body every single day. Compared to his life, his attitude and actions with that of the great example of Jesus. Doesn't matter how long we've been a Christian, every day that race is to be run. As we mentioned so often, Christianity is not a sprint, it's a marathon. If we live life long enough, and some people are converting the last a couple of months of their life, that's all right, but those who are younger, the class of many of you, you've had to live that Christian race a while, and you and I must do what Paul did, to be careful, to be disciplined. There are things that are evil desired within all of us that must not be encouraged, that must not be fed. They cry out for attention. The world encourages that. But like Paul, we have to be able to say, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I don't want to have to do it all this. Here one day, you're disqualified. You're just walking. I don't know how many of you follow golf, but uh, I'm not a, a, as a golf enthusiast as it was years ago when Arnold Palmer was, was golfing. But I know many of you might be a Tiger Woods fan. Anybody hear about what happened? He got disqualified. He had a two stroke penalty, and there was questions about whether or not he, he should be disqualified. I said, What would that do to the master, the Tiger Woods? You know, the main uh, character of golf, he was disqualified. Well, uh, they made it away, we didn't have to be, but let's imagine that it was. We still have to go on. A lot of people wouldn't like it. And I know there are a lot of people today, if they had to stand before the judge of the of God, would be surprised to find out that they too might be disqualified because they didn't stay with it in the year to the end. Uh, there are people that Paul mentions from time to time. Let's uh, introduce a, a fellow by the name of Demons. Turn with me to the book of Colossians. Book of Colossians chapter 4. Verse 14. There's Paul writing about the church of Colossae sometime in the 60s A.D. 
Paul about 63, 64 AD, as he mentions some of his companions, he talks about one particular individual, look at verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. There were people who at the time, and Demas is the fellow in question here, at this point in time, the Apostle Paul's ministry, he was active, he was a participant, he was uh, involved in a missionary effort with Paul who said, hey, but no, I want to greet them as well. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is the Apostle Paul. That's his last words. Under inspiration, to follow up the end reading with me, verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9, verse 10. Be diligent. You come to me quickly, Paul tells Timothy, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, has departed from Thessalonica, the present from Galatians, out of the Dalmatian. When Paul wrote Colossians, Demas was a companion, a worker. And by the time the Apostle Paul ends his life, Demas had forsaken him, had forsaken the world. He was someone who was right there on the, on the run of the action. You know, with the, with the battle was really fought. Front line, with Paul, missionary journey, doing some of the greatest work in all the world, but he failed out. He forsook the work and went back into the world. Look with me, if you will, the book of Luke, chapter 9. Look at Luke, chapter 9. Look at verse 57. To follow along with the reading, the true cost of discipleship. Verse 57 and Adam, as they journeyed on the road, someone said, oh, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to the flocks and sack holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me, but he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to them, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Another also said, Lord, I'll follow you. So let me first go and bid them farewell to go out of my house. Numbers verse 62, if you would. Jesus said to no one, having put his hand in the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Folks, that's a powerful passage. And that's a, that's a scary passage. But that's the truth. Someone who plows or does the right thing and then gets it up, looks back, waits for it, and heads that way, and Jesus says, You're not fit. For the kingdom of God. So can someone fall? But at one time was saved spiritually, the answer is certainly yes. If you will turn with the book of John, chapter 10, if you're studying with people about eternal security, this is their go-to passage. You'll see why in a minute. We'll give an explanation of that. John chapter 10. Let's stop with verse 22. Kind of pick up the, the context. John chapter 10, verse 22. It was the feast of dedication to Jerusalem, and it was winter. Jesus walked in the temple at Solomon's porch, and the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in that? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, when you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe me because you're not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And you would think, just a, a quick read of this passage. Hey, this passage seems to be talking about eternal security. Once you're in the hand of God, uh, no one can snatch you. I can't pluck you out of that hand. So once you become a Christian, you can't be lost. If you're one of the Lord's sheep. Well, if you will, let me point you back to a particular verse. Who's he talking about? If you look at verse 27, you see the qualification of those who are the Lord's sheep. Two things are mentioned, two conditions are mentioned that are important. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And that's true. If you take someone that uh, you know, Jesus is a shepherd and people are in the habit of, you know, as we all become Christian, we're, we're part of the sheep, part of the Lord's, he's a shepherd, we're part of the sheepfold. 
But Jesus says, if you continue to listen to me, if you will hear my voice and follow me, then no one can touch you. Well, brother, I believe that. There is security for those Christians who continue day by day, week after week, month after month, year after year, the Lord calls us home. You continue to hear the voice of the Lord and follow the voice of the Lord. Mentioned there in that passage, no one's going to be able to take you away. But what if you stop here? What if you stop following? Well, you know all the Lord's sheep. And people will be able to pluck out of the devil if you do that because you'll go. You either listen to the Lord, you either follow the Lord, or you're not listening to the Lord. You listen to the Lord. You can't have it both ways. Some people try to do it part time. Oh, I, on Sundays it's easy to become a Christian, but other days of the week or not, you can't be that way. Jesus said you have to make a choice. But the revelation, one of the churches, the church of Laodicea, lukewarm. Jesus said, I wish you were cold or hot. You can't be both. You're either firmly in salvation of the Lord or you're not. If you're not, it's because you quit listening, you quit hearing, and you, and you quit following. Your soul is important. You can easily drift if not careful, and the warnings are plentiful in the book of Hebrews. I remember years ago when I was out of South Haven, one of the things that had been going, had been going on for many, many years is a, is a Sunday night visitation program. They broke the congregation up into 10 teams. Every Sunday night, two teams met for a fellowship meal at someone's home, and the leaders would pass out the assignment. They'd been doing that when I was down there some 15, 16, 17 years. About twice a year, they'd have a big dinner, fellowship dinner on a Sunday night. They would invite in a guest speaker to kind of rally the troops and, you know, to compliment, to commend them for continuing that visitation program. But I remember one time when a fellow by the name of Keith Mosier, those of you that pay attention to the videos on, on Wednesday night might have seen him. He's still a full-time full instructor at the Memphis School of Preaching. He made the point. When you go out and make the visits, how long are those visits? It's not enough for some just to go and say, well, we've been missing you. Talk about everything in the world. And then the last couple of minutes, I wish you'd come more and leave it at that. He said, here's what they need. They need Bible study. Bible studies is what helped them become Christians to begin with. If they're losing it, if their faith is beginning to shrink, what they need again are Bible studies. He said, let me tell you a good book to study. When people are awake, the book of Hebrews is what's the book of Hebrews about. The book of Hebrews is about Christians of a Jewish background that had become weary of all the persecution that came upon them because they were you know, they were the minority in the nation of Israel. Everybody around, they own, they own the world, basically. That if you became a Christian, you might be cast out of the synagogue and pay a price. And some were tired and weary of that. They'd give it in, give it out, give it up. But the book of Hebrews said, you need to be careful. Look at a couple of those warnings that were there that were real in this lesson of the years. Let's look at the passage uh, we concluded with this morning. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. I just want you to notice that the excerpt of chapter 2, 3, and 4, the discernment of Hebrew right ahead, there were people who were in trouble and they needed to be warned. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore we must give more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest we drift away. As we mentioned this morning, it can happen. For the word spoken to angels proved steadfast, and, and every transgression and obedience received a just reward. How shall we escape, escape if we neglect? So great a salvation. People were doing that. They were going to be in trouble. The same can happen today. Look at chapter 3. Begin with verse 12. There's a concern in Paul's writing. The Hebrew writer of writing, which I believe be Paul. Look at verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now, who's he writing this to? He calls them brethren. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And departing from the living God. What made them brethren was the fact they believed. Now they stopped believing. Because of that, they were in trouble. But exhort, verse 13, one another daily, well, it's called a day, lest it of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of any sovereign Christians there. Don't let your heart be hardened by saying they can do that. For we have become partakers of Christ if, if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Look at the next.
next chapter, chapter 4, verse 9. There remain therefore a rest for the people of God. For he, for he who has entered his rest as to himself also ceased from his works as God did from us. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example. This is, if you can't read these passages, searching, searching for the truth and not conclude, these people were in trouble because they were neglecting their salvation. Heading back into the world. One final passage, the book of Hebrews. Most of you know about the Hebrews 10, verse 25. The forsaken assembly would be encouraged at the beginning of verse 19. For those people who were becoming weaker by the moment. Verse 19 is written, Hebrews 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without waver, for he who promises faithful. Let's consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Then he introduces something that wasn't happening for some. Not forsaking the seven ourselves together as a matter of some. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Then he writes, For we sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who's rejected Moses' law dies without mercy in the testimony of two or three witnesses. Notice verse 29, if you will. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy to trample the Son of God underfoot, counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? For well, we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands. For living that whole sentence, that's a scary passage. That's a terrifying passage for those who have been slothful in their Christian walk. Warning after warning after warning is contained in the book of Hebrews. And I'm sure some responded to that same message that is needed today. There are people who used to walk in the door sitting where you are. Out there in the world today, cold and callous, the deceitfulness of sin hardened their heart. One time they came in here and sung these songs of joy with you in other places. But that blood that redeemed them, as the Hebrew writer says, their life, their manner of life, it insults the blood of Jesus. It insults. Maybe years ago, maybe, <coughs> along about midnight, the long awaited bags of stem cells. In and that's his room. It was Blake the Lane from somewhere up in the northeast, those stem cells that hopefully would save Nancy's life and the stem cell trend, but just two small bags. But what were they worth? Worth at least the possibility of the future. Brought in by the doctor in charge of Nancy's case and by his best nurse, there at the IV, I saw those stem cells go into the arm of my beloved wife at the time. Can you imagine what would happen? If somebody came in and said, watch this, get through it down the ground and stop going. <laughs> I'd be mad. There's a chance to save someone's life, but it, it's an insult. Well, no one did that. No one would think about that. But think about this. To be a Christian, to wear the name, and then suddenly, over a period of time, to say, look, I don't care about that. That wasn't a shit. Basically, is it held by a callous view to people who no longer respect it. There are things. They're dear to me. They're things that are near and dear to you. They're possessions you probably have in your home. Maybe a beloved that's been on before. Maybe it's yours. Maybe a letter. Maybe a book. Or something that you value. Someone took it from you and burned it up, would you be mad? Rather, does it make you mad? To see the Lord's blood insulted the way some Christians do. Brother, that should be enough motivation in and of itself. The warm people 
have something they want to escape. Unless they turn back. That should be a motivation to be involved in money, not visitation, or whatever it is. Man, woman, it doesn't matter. Being a Christian is serious. It's about life. Christianity is not a Sunday stroll with you. It's a way of life. So read some. The gospel of grace is precious. The greatest possession you have is salvation. What do you get? It comes to you, compliments of a gracious Savior who wants you to have. It. Don't squander it. Don't blow it. Don't compromise it. Don't cheapen it. Don't insult it. By the way, the rest is precious. And may this place surely become a new time, a place of grace. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, let me encourage you. Tonight, let me ask you, why not tonight? In the old song book of Carnes, number 26. Why not tonight? That's the song of invitation I responded to October 5th, 1965, the 14-year-old Tim. That's a powerful song. I wish we sung it more. That's the song we're going to ask questions. You're going to ask you tonight if you're outside of the Christ. If you need to become a Christian and have your sins washed away, be baptized in Christ for the remission of your sins, baptism for that purpose, that all things are ready to come to the face. If you're a very Christian, you've been callous in your Christian race. You need to finish the race, pick up the baton, get back in it, and run away with discipline until the Lord said it's time. And if you need to respond to the invitation, do so now.